A very warm welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is Dana Minbaeva. I'm professor in strategic and global HRM at Copenhagen Business School and an area editor for Journal of International Business Studies. And I will be your host today. Um, this series of webinars uh, provides a forum for sharing research insights recently published in the Academy of International Business Journals, uh, Journal of International Business Studies and Journal of International Business Policy. First of all, I would like to express a, um, a deeper thanks to the technical support provided to the AIB Secretariat. Uh, and I would like to introduce um, my um, co-pilot uh, and co-organizer, uh, Professor Klaus Meyer. And also with us on the call, we have um, the editor-in-chief for the Journal of International Business Studies, Professor Alan Bebek. So today we have a, um, a very interesting seminar, excuse me, a webinar featuring um, work which was very recently published in Chips and Tips on the topic of multicultural. And the question that we are going to explore today is, are there particular circumstances under which the unique skills and competence of multiculturals can create competitive advantage for multinational corporations? Uh, you, as participants, um, are encouraged to actively participate in the discussion um, by posting your questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. And uh, it's right at the bottom of your screen. So you should see a button that says Q&A. That's where you can write your questions. By the way, you should be also able to like, quote unquote, like questions, which will make them uh, uh, moving up in the list and uh, uh, hence uh, bring them to the attention of the panelists. I will pick up the questions from the Q&A uh, sessions and direct them to our panelists. We also have chat um, for any other comments. So please use all these opportunities to engage. We very much look forward to hearing from you. But let me uh, now uh, introduce you to our first speaker. Davina Vor is an Associate Professor of International Business at the State University of New York at New Paltz. She received her PhD uh, degree in International Business from the University of South Carolina, and she has held visiting positions in Finland, Peru, and Thailand. Her research interests relate to cross-cultural management issues, such as individual level multiculturalism, global leadership, psychological attachment, boundary spanning, and the influence of culture on individuals and groups. Davina, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for the invitation to be part of this webinar. I'm excited to be here today. Um, let's see if I can share my screen properly. There we go. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about a paper my colleagues and I published in 2019 called Multiculturalism Within Individuals, a Review, Critique, and Agenda for Future Research. You can see all of our team members there. We come from many different countries. Over 16 cultures were represented. It was a very exciting project and everybody contributed a lot. Unfortunately, only one of us could speak today, but I'll hope to give you a brief summary of what we did. So since today's webinar is focused on how multiculturals can affect m and &E outcomes, I'm just going to briefly talk about the review component of our paper and focus a bit more on our agenda for future research. So for our review, uh, for those of you that saw the paper already, um, we basically reviewed the literature on individual level multiculturalism in six fields, anthropology, international business, management, marketing, psychology, sociology. And this review showed five main conceptual themes in the definitions. 
So multiculturalism defined by context. So for example, cultural heritage or colonial history, acculturation of people adapting to a new culture, skills and abilities like bicultural competence or bridging, cognition relates to internalization of different cultural schemas, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, identification of seeing yourself as part of multiple cultural groups. So given this is sort of the background and interdisciplinary perspective, we developed a conceptualization of multiculturalism along what we call a tri-dimensional spectrum. Um, so basically individual level multiculturalism, we define as the degree to which someone has knowledge of identification with and internalization of more than one societal culture. So degree, because it's not a yes, no binary type of thing. Instead, it's along a continuum. And we believe people need to have knowledge, identification, and internalization of these cultures. So they have to know something, explicit and tacit knowledge about the culture, um, its values, norms, practices. They need to attach emotional significance and value to being part of the group of that culture. And then internalization, they've adopted some of the norms, values, practices of the culture of their own. We used more than one culture instead of two or more because we wanted to allow for emergent and hybrid cultures. And we also use the term societal culture broadly. So it's not just national culture. It could be pan-national culture, for example, Arab culture. Um, it could also be cultural differences within a country. So regional differences or state differences. So for example, Bengali and Gujarati culture in India, two different states are quite different. So. We believe this conceptualization adds to the literature by trying to unify it a bit using the base that's there in multiple fields. Our hope is that people will use this so there's more consensus um, and more comparability of future studies. The second part of our review related to the measurement of multiculturalism, just briefly, there was a mismatch between conceptualization and measures. You can see our supplemental tables for lots of details and recommended measures. So moving on to what I'd like to focus on, um, our cyclical model of multiculturalism. We suggest both antecedents to multiculturalism and consequences of multiculturalism. So just briefly in terms of the societal context, research in sociology and psychology suggests that societal level types of factors influence multiculturalism. So, for example, a national policy related to multiculturalism can influence whether someone will enact their multiculturalism. So if you have a policy that embraces cultural differences, people will be more likely to embrace their different cultures versus say more of an assimilation policy. But as IB scholars, obviously we're more interested in the international business context. So that's what we'll focus on. We look at the organizational context, developing cross-level research questions, specifically focusing on social networks and power dynamics. So we focused on these two factors because research in anthropology and sociology has talked a lot about both of these with regard to multiculturalism, albeit not with regard to the organizational context, but as I'm sure you all know, organizational literature has talked a fair bit about this. So this seemed like a good way to provide an interdisciplinary perspective on multiculturalism. In addition, we hope that this might reconcile two kind of different views of multiculturalism. So the contextual view where, for example, socio-political factors are primary with the more agentic view of multiculturalism. So research in sociology in particular talks a fair bit about how individuals can actively construct their multiculturalism. So they can engage with a cultural group and become accepted members of that group. So, we suggest that the organizational context can influence individual level multiculturalism and also multiculturalism can affect the organizational context. And we have a few research questions related to this. So our first research question relates to social networks. So network diversity, tie strength, network centrality, all of this can influence multiculturalism. If we think about the m &E context, um, MEs that use a multi domestic strategy might have fewer ties or limited reciprocity with other units. So, this could lead multicultural employees to focus on only one of their cultures. So, for example, 
local employees could be seen mainly as host country nationals, even if they have multiple cultures. And then the research in sociology suggests that those who are pressured to enact one of their cultures could lead to pushing back um, and emphasizing these other cultures or suppressing their multiple cultures. So IHRM practices could perhaps be used that would avoid imposing cultural identities on individuals. So that's in terms of the antecedents for social networks. In terms of the effects, um, we're expecting that multicultural was also impact social networks. So as I mentioned, sociology researchers have talked about how individuals can assert agency over their circumstances, over the context. So multiculturals could draw upon their different cultures to purposefully strengthen ties with members of specific cultural groups within and outside the organization. So they could use their shared in-group affiliations to form network ties across cultural and organizational boundaries. This could lead to more boundary spanning behaviors between units and across different cultures. Multicultural individuals also might have more network centrality than monocultural individuals who only have one culture, which could influence m and &E social network patterns. So maybe they could build new pathways for cross-border knowledge flows. In addition, networks might vary based on these different dimensions of multiculturalism. So for example, multicultural knowledge might lead to more cultural brokering uh, between employees of different cultures where the multicultural employee could explain to others, these are the cultural reasons for certain behaviors, which could create connections that might not have otherwise existed. Identification could also facilitate interpersonal relationships, so that could potentially bridge structural holes um, across units in different countries. And internalization perhaps um, could mitigate stereotypical thinking and some judgmental responses to different cultural groups. So this could help to reduce conflict, maybe encourage more intercultural interactions. So overall, we think that multiculturalism could be ideal for building new connections between m and &E units and across cultures within units as well. Then in terms of power dynamics, Research on multiculturalism in anthropology and sociology largely focuses on majority groups having more power than minority groups in society. They talk a lot about these structural and social disadvantages from racism, discrimination, and class. So if we think about this from an organizational perspective um, and the m and &E context, it's possible that m and that have more centralized power, so more home country orientation, maybe an ethnocentric mindset, they might foster prejudice, discrimination against employees from lower status groups. And that could lead to less acceptance of individual level multiculturalism. Similarly, it's possible that adoption of a corporate language that matches that of the home country could send a message that that's the language and identity that is the most important. So that could lead to multicultural employees suppressing one or more of their cultures, or perhaps again, asserting their threatened identity, which could lead to negative effects like emotional distress of the employee or non-compliance with company rules. In contrast, if you have an m and &E that has a bit more dispersed power, um, so more of a transnational strategy, more of a geocentric mindset, perhaps more of a multilingual environment. Employees might feel as though the organization is signaling that they value multiculturalism and the associated skills. So they might be more likely to enact their multiculturalism. And then finally, in terms of the effects, um, again, we believe that multiculturalism can influence power dynamics. So sociology research recognizes that resources associated with social and cultural capital can be potential sources of power for multicultural individuals. So looking at the organizational perspective, um, we know that individual level social capital can influence social capital of m and &E units. So if we look at the individual level, multicultural individuals could potentially boost the power of lower status individuals in organizations by recognizing their contributions. So for example, if multiculturals are motivated by their in-group affiliation with lower status groups um, and know about the cultural norms that might limit a group's career success, these multiculturals might suggest human resources procedures and processes that could help to find and develop talent of these lower status individuals. So maybe suggesting promotion practices that are less biased maybe advocating for a mentorship program. 
And again, multicultural individuals are well suited to recognizing and developing sources of subsidiary influence. So for example, they might draw upon their multicultural knowledge to highlight critical resources available to the MNE from the subsidiary from the host country. They might draw upon their multiple in-group affiliations to build network connections between members of the subsidiary and the rest of the MNE, which could increase the subsidiary's network centrality and perhaps its power. Multiculturals might also help subsidiaries gain legitimacy by bridging local practices and headquarters expectations through their multiple sets of cultural norms. They might recognize opportunities for reverse innovation, which again could help subsidiaries gain influence and potentially power in the MNE. So overall, Multiculturalism could lead to a shift in the power dynamics in the MNE. And obviously, we would need more research on how multiculturalism could shift this, uh, both between low and high status individual and groups, and also between MNE units. And we think it would also be interesting to look at the differential effects of these different dimensions of multiculturalism. So I only have 10 minutes. I'm not sure if I'm done with it, but in conclusion, um, basically we developed a tridimensional spectrum of multiculturalism that we believe could be useful for unifying the field um, and hope people will use this. We believe that organizational context will influence the enactment of multiculturalism and also is affected by multiculturalism, specifically believing that social networks and power dynamics warrant a bit more research um, as well as the different dimensions of multiculturalism multiculturalism. So thanks so much and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much Davina and uh, please uh, post your questions to Davina and the co-authors or comment on, uh, on the um, paper and presentation in the Q&A as well as chat. I would very much encourage those of you who didn't have a chance to read this paper to do so because I think it's a um, it's a very interesting work. Uh, I, I personally, I particularly like how you managed to unfold the layers of the uh, context of individual level of multiculturalism without simplifying the very, could say, dynam dynamic relations between inward and outward influences. So very interesting paper indeed, and looking forward to, to discuss it. I would like to introduce our second speaker. Iko Liao is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney Business School, and she holds a PhD in international business from BD School of Business in Simon Fraser University. Prior to joining University of Sydney, Iko worked as an assistant professor at the Department of Managing People and Organizations at IESA Business School in Spain. Because research interests lie in cross-cultural management, cultural intelligence and multiculturalism. Iko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dana, for the lovely introduction. Thank you, Davina, for your excellent review on multiculturalism and interesting suggestions for future research. Let me share my screen with you. It's my honor to present the paper here at this webinar on behalf of my co-authors, Professor Stacy for Siemens and Professor David Thomas. When we started this paper, we knew from the literature that multicultural individuals have advantages in their cognitive abilities. They have higher level of integrative complexity and higher level of uh, cultural mental condition. But what we did not know at the time was their abilities in the context of organization. So in this paper, we investigated outcomes of multicultural employees and how they can contribute to their organizations. We conceptualize um, two dimensions, identity dimensions for multiculturalism. The first one is identity plurality. That is the number of primary cultural identities. And primary cultural identities are those that held deeply based on internalized cultural schemas, not those situated identities people can try on and discard later. And one, on the one end of this dimension, we have people who identify with a primary culture and a second culture that is less important, which is represented by the size of the circles. And for example, I may feel Australian Chinese, but China is more important to me. And on the other end, we have people identify strongly with multiple cultures. For example, someone will feel Australian Chinese and Spanish at the same time very strongly. 
And uh, this dimension is different to simply counting the number of cultures a person identifies with because it can differentiate uh, people who uh, identify fully and strongly with two cultures and people who identify strongly fully with one but only partially with a second culture. The second dimension is identity integration. The extent to which people keep their identities integrated or separate. When people keep their so, uh, culture identities separate, they tend to uh, identify with different cultures across situations. For example, I may feel Chinese at home, but Australian at work. But when people keep their identities integrated, they um, combine those cultures and create a unique culture. So together with those two dimensions, we can produce a map and to compare different cultural patterns on multicultural individuals. And people can land anywhere on this map. Monocultures is a special case. They land on the very end of this uh, identity plurality and there's no variation of identity integration. And we study how identity plurality and integration influence those uh, three categories outcomes personal task and social outcomes through different mechanisms. The relationship between those identity dimensions and personal psychological distress can be explained by internal inconsistency. When people identify with a culture, they also internalize the corresponding cultural schemas. Those are the uh, values, norms, assumptions, and expected behaviors. And so when identity plurality is low, when people have only one primary culture, then they only use that particular culture identity and schema to define who they are and to, to guide their behaviors. But when plurality is high, then people internalize multiple schemas. And very often those values, norms, assumptions associated with those different schemas are in conflict with each other. So people might feel torn between those demanding uh, requirements uh, with their multiple identities and feel uncertain and inconsistent. So similarly, uh, when people keep their identity separate, they tend to view their cultures as incompatible and they also experience uh, ambivalence and confusion about their identity. But when they keep their identities integrated, then they tend to view those cultures as harmonious, compatible, and they experience less uh, psychological toll. And therefore, we expect that when plurality increases and integration decreases, people will experience a higher level of internal consistency, which lead to higher level of psychological distress. The relationship between identity dimensions and task performance outcomes can be explained by two different mechanisms. The first one is uh, straightforward. Identity plurality increases the resources multicultural in individuals possess. The more uh, culture in schemas internalize, the more knowledge structures you develop and the larger toolbox you can draw on when you solve problems in the intercultural interaction uh, situations. The second mechanism is the bright side of internal inconsistency. Although they cause psychological distress, at the same time, they also allow people to develop a more complex cognitive structures. When we experience internal consistency, there's like a flow of uh, psychological flow state, right? There's like a state of minus, everything runs smoothly and we feel right about everything. People don't pay much attention to the task. But when people face the de uh, conflicting demands or information that this confirms their expectations, then people are more likely to engage in a deeper level analysis of the issues. They may uh, try to understand where each perspective comes from, what has constraints, what are consequences, what are the relationship among all those perspectives. So through the process of understanding those um, competing perspectives and drawing links between different ideas, people are um, able to develop a more complex cognitive structures. And they also become more skillful 
by developing alternative strategies in international uh, intercultural situations. And because plurality increase and integration decrease internal consistency, we expect a positive relationship between identity plurality and intercultural skills and a negative relationship between identity integration and intercultural skills. And finally, the relationship between identity plurality and social outcome can be explained by two mechanisms as well. First, according to social identity theory, people tend to view their in-groups favorably, more favorably than their outcomes in order to increase their self-esteem. So they're more likely to build social connections uh, and ties with their in-groups than with their out-groups. So when you identify with multiple cultures, then naturally you have friends from those multiple cultures. And at the same time, when your in-group become more heterogeneous in terms of cultural backgrounds, the boundary becomes blurry as well. Say you have friends who are Australians, Chinese, French, and Italians, and then you're less likely to use cultural dimension to draw a boundary between who are your in-groups, who are your out-groups, right? You're more likely to use other criteria like personality, shared interests, or professional backgrounds to draw that boundary. Um, so your, your friendships are not restricted to the cultures you have, to the cultures you identify with, but can be spanned to a wider range of cultures. Therefore, we expect a positive relationship between identity plurality and the in-group cultural diversity. To test those hypotheses, we conducted three empirical studies with over a thousand participants with different demographic backgrounds. In study one, we have uh, we had um, students who had uh, part-time work experience and all of them were multicultural individuals. In study two and three, we invited both multicultural and monocultural employees in a hotel chain and a healthcare organization. This is the general pattern uh, across the three studies. We found identity plurality consistently predicted task and social outcomes, and identity integration consistently predicted personal psychological distress. So based on our uh, results, we see some exciting future directions for research. First, uh, past research has focus more on cultural uh, identity integration. And we suggest that future research should focus on identity plurality and examine individuals across the multicultural spectrum, ranging from monocultures to highly multicultures. Our studies suggested that plurality has a more stable relationship with social and task outcomes, which suggests plurality might be a better predictor of organizational outcomes um, for organizational research. And to better understand plurality, we need to move beyond cognitive mechanisms. Cognitive mechanisms tend to focus on the knowledge structure and the consistency between those knowledge structures. But we can um, use other mechanisms like motivational social mechanisms. Um, like we studied how people are motivated to make friends with different cultural backgrounds according to social identity theory. And future research should also expand to more outcomes that are relevant to organizations. For example, social networks. And this one has been discussed by Davina as well, right? How multicultural individuals form their social ties based on their um, in-group affiliations. And they can use those ties to bridge people across uh, cultural and organizational boundaries. We can also study their um, leadership skills. How do multicultural leaders lead a multicultural force and how do they contribute to multicultural or global virtual teams? And finally, future research should also look at organizational contexts that either constrain or enable multiculturalism. I think Davina also discussed power dynamics as one of the examples. And if multicultural individuals, employees, they have those special skills and competences they can contribute to organizations, then we need to understand how um, 
organizations can better support them, can better leverage the skills and better to help them realize their potentials. And that's all. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the Q&As. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, again, super interesting paper. Uh, I found that particularly the two dimensions that you identified that uh, theorized about, about the paper and incredibly helpful in, I would say, general mapping of uh, accumulated knowledge in the area of uh, cultural identities and international business. So looking forward to discussion. Let me introduce our uh, third speaker. Jennifer Axel is a professor of, in the Cogat School of Business at American University. Jennifer received her PhD degree in business strategy from the University of, South, of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research um, and teaching broadly focused on the competitive implications of social, economic, and environmental sustainability challenge. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Shauna, and uh, it's wonderful to follow Davina and Echo. I think our papers fit nicely, and certainly there's a lot of overlap we can discuss as well. Uh, I just like to, uh, this paper that I'm going to be talking about today was co-authored with Chang Huno uh, from the University of Kansas, and this, it was published in the Journal of International Business Policy. And, you know, if Chang and I have been working together for a long time now, and one of the issues that we've been very interested in is, you know, what are the factors that create situations of violent conflict? How do companies manage those risks? And how do we understand the dynamics a little bit more so that uh, multinational corporations can develop strategies to more effectively operate? And it's also good for the host countries too, because if the more that they are able to create jobs, maybe the less likely they'll be in conflict. So as we were doing, uh, you know, various studies on, on multinational operations, multinational enterprises operations in conflict affected countries, we started thinking a lot about uh, ethnic diversity. Because throughout the literature, particularly in economics and political science, uh, the research tends to show that and, and certainly leans towards the idea that ethnic diversity is a source of conflict and that it's really uh, almost something uh, to avoid. Uh, that's kind of the implication of a lot of this work. And so what, but that didn't really resonate with a lot of what we see certainly happening in the, you know, um, in the United States historically. We, despite the fact that we have immense, you know, racial, uh, you know, discrimination, we have plenty of conflict internally in the United States. We are still, uh, you know, a very diverse society and we're also one that's very attractive for foreign direct investment. We've also often been, you know, for many years, the number one destination for foreign direct investment. So how do we reconcile these different ideas? Uh, and I think this, I like this map on uh, the United States because it shows all the different, you know, it gives you the impression that what we're really looking at is how do you bring all these different backgrounds together in a way that they can be complementary rather than, you know, one single U.S. culture. This is looking at how can we uh, take advantage of the richness uh, of ethnic diversity. And then the picture on the, you know, the other picture is uh, in Ethiopia. It is actual ethnic conflict uh, in Ethiopia. I think this uh, uh, maybe, you know, so I, Easterly and uh, Levine had a very, you know, highly cited article arguing that, uh, and they did a study in Africa and they argued that, you know, the more diversity you have, the more likely you are to have conflict. And that has become a very influential paper and that's led to, uh, you know, the use of a lot of indices around fractionalization and um, really looking at it as, as a, a risk. So I think, you know, in much of, in many studies, there's a control for fractionalization with the idea that it would create a more negative environment. Uh, but then in, in political science, uh, there's uh, Paul Collier and Hoffler uh, have done a lot of research too. And they said, well, that's not exactly the case. And, uh, it's not because of diversity. It's because of how diversity is managed and who are, you know, kind of uh, leading back to some of uh, Davina's work on, on power dynamics, it's who's in, who's out, uh, what, you know, are there, are certain groups excluding others? And so we wanted to delve more deeply into this, particularly given the fact that, uh, oh, let's see, I think I, there we go. Uh, particularly given the fact that, you know, certainly in much of management research and a lot of uh, international research or business research as well, we see diversity as a source of 
uh, innovation and growth and, and see it in a really positive way. So how do we reconcile all these different studies? Um, all right, so yeah, so these are essentially the studies that I was mentioning earlier. And so um, the slides will be posted and you can read the paper for more information on that. But we wanted to go, uh, our, our contribution to the research was to look at how does it affect, if we look at ethnic groups in terms of who's included and who's excluded economically and politically in the institutional fabric and governance of the country, how does that affect uh, you know, investment and labor productivity? And is it, are there other factors than just having a diverse population or is it more about being included or excluded? Uh, so we had our first hypothesis was looking at, you know, when levels of ethnic diversity in a country are high or low, one ethnic group is less likely to exclude other groups. Therefore, ethnic conflict is low for businesses. Thus, with this idea that ethnic diversity would have a U-shaped relationship. And so, um, and so that was our first hypothesis. And then we did a similar hypothesis for employee productivity. When the levels of ethnic diversity in a country are either high or low, one ethnic group is less likely to exclude other groups. Uh, you know, one of the, the ideas is that certainly if you have a, a very diverse population, then it's gonna be much harder for people. Well, first of all, it becomes a, just a norm. Everybody's accustomed to having a diverse population and there's nothing, you know, it's particularly different about it. So there may be, it's one of the many reasons they might be less likely to organize and, uh, and exclude others. And, um, and similarly, there might be, uh, you know, and so we can talk a little bit about that more as we go along here. But. Uh, and so in terms of findings, so I can get right to the, um, you know, what we found here, we found that at low levels of ethnic diversity, employee productivity is high uh, for both foreign and domestic firms. Uh, but once diversity becomes more pervasive in society and the organization and employees exposure to diversity becomes normalized, uh, then uh, you know, em em it, employee productivity can be very high and it doesn't have an, a, a perceived or a real negative effect. Uh, and I think that in both cases, what we're really getting at here is that uh, you know, managers are, that the idea that you have a higher level of risk uh, when you have either a highly homogenous society or, um, a, you know, uh, or excuse me, a moderately diverse society. Because what happens in a moderately diverse society is that different groups can get together and then form coalitions and uh, exclude other groups. Where we see that the research shows and in our data it shows that they're much less likely to do so at the high and low ends. Uh, uh, you know, really high levels of diversity or low levels of diversity. Um, so it's at the moderate levels that this becomes most important. Uh, all right. And, you know, one of the, I think, certainly we see that playing out now in the U.S., although we did this study a long time ago. Uh, you know, when one of this, uh, you know, huge source of conflict here is that we have in-groups, out-groups, some groups that are not included, this whole idea of inclusion, of how do we bring people in so that they are included in the political and economic process and maximize that. That is gonna lead to less division, conflict, uh, et cetera. And so those are the things that we should look at when we're looking at countries in which to invest. That countries that have more, where different groups are included um, will be a much more desirable environment in which to operate. If you have high levels of exclusion of, based on ethnicity, then you have conditions right for uh, unrest. Um, and then I think that, you know, there's an opportunity to look at these issues within organizations as well. Excuse me. Uh, that, and, and this leads to kind of the, the previous two presentations, that uh, there's maybe similar dynamics at play. And I know Carol Reed has looked at a lot of these issues in the context of Sri Lanka. Um, uh, another example is uh, there was a company in the Ivory Coast called Protina, and they had found that at, there was just by the, the nature of the type of work they were doing, there was one ethnic group during the day and one ethnic group at night. And every time it shift changed, they ran into conflict. But the company introduced a dinner at that point and got everybody together. And over time, that really had a huge difference. I made a huge difference in uh, the organization. And so I think, I guess, when I think about future research is, and it certainly, uh, again, ties back to the other presentations is how do we develop effective strategies for managing diversity, both at the company level and the country level? 
I, these, this study shows, you know, certainly implies that it's in the interest of companies to engage in policy development and, poli and support policies that provide inclusion in the United States and other countries, because that leads to lower conflict. And likewise in organizations to be very conscious about, uh, you know, the, how the dynamics in society may play out in the workplace. All right, thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Super interesting presentation and uh, uh, lots of questions in here. So let me start by um, um, actually, first of all, thank, thank, thanking uh, you of presenters as well as your co-authors for putting together such a wonderful job. Um, and uh, I would like to start this question from David Kozermosen who's um, actually questioning uh, how can we deal with the concept of multicultural, multiculturalism in terms of the outcomes that concept may produce. So particularly he's asking, should we also focus more on, on, on what aspects slash elements of multiculturalism that might influence A or B versus X and Y? And I, I think that the interesting aspect in here because obviously you by now have persuaded us that multiculturalism is not a you know homogeneous concept so obviously uh, uh you know when looking at the outcomes that this particular uh, concept produces we should also take this into consideration davina would you like us uh, would you like to get us started on on, on this um yeah. what, what what's your point yeah. yeah, so that's part of the reason, and I realized that I, I kind of went pretty fast, so sorry, Miguel, I know I spoke really quickly, um, but we have the three dimensions of multiculturalism, and we suggest that the different dimensions perhaps could be looked at a little more specifically in terms of what the effects would be for each. So. We had a lot of discussion in the group about how this would work, um, but basically we do think that there would probably be differential effects so that for some things, perhaps identification might play more of a role, for other things, maybe internalization would play more of a role. So we do believe that it, it is kind of important to look at these different dimensions. You can kind of aggregate them overall, but, but we are interested in sort of the more specific dimension. So basically, yes, David, I agree with you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course, Jennifer and Echo, feel free to jump in at uh, any moment. Jennifer, would you like to add something? You can see you on it. Um, I think, it, no, I think Davina did a great job and I think it spoke mostly to, you know, what she was doing. So I definitely. Mm, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, I have another question. Um, and this one's coming from Yin Chin Li. Uh, and this question is for you, Echo. Um, Actually, I had the same uh, kind of reaction as in Chin uh, because he writes, when you presented the two-dimensional framework, plurality and integration, very much look like by uh, the beloved two by two uh, space, uh, hence, they, they, hence they should have been some interaction effects. However, um, in your empirical analysis, you seem to treat them as two mutually independent variables. So are there interaction effects? or are these two you know, very independent uh, 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 Thank you very much, Yi-Ting, for this good question. Good to see you here. Um, so when we um, um, started this project, we were thinking theoretically how those two dimensions will have different mechanisms influencing the outcomes. That's why we theorized and tested the two dimensions independently. Mm -hmm. And that's why we didn't theorize any interactions or test uh, the interaction effect. And uh, this paper was written many years ago. So frankly, I don't remember whether we have tried the internet interaction effect. Uh, I will come back to you later after the presentation to find out whether there's an interaction. I, I don't remember, that's a very long time ago. But we do want you to emphasize those different mechanisms, not just um, cognitive mechanisms, but motivational mechanisms. That's why we look at those two um, dimensions separately. Right, but just if I may follow up on that one, Echo, don't you think that conceptually speaking, it would be interesting to look at the interaction? Um, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, because um, for two of the uh, outcomes, personal and task outcomes, we theorize how both of them influence the outcome through the internal inconsistency. So in that case, there will be a moderating effect, right? When you have higher plurality and when you keep the identity separate, then there will be a higher level of um, in internal inconsistency leading to either higher level of psychological distress or higher level of task performance. So theoretically, there might be a interaction when they go through the same mechanism. Mm -hmm. And um, if there are different mechanism, um, just thinking aloud, if there's a motivation, but for social outcomes, we don't expect any interaction effect because we argue many that um, identity plurality influence social outcomes through those motivational mechanisms, but we don't see how identity integration would influence social outcome um, through uh, cognitive mechanism. So for social outcome, we we'll probably don't see an interaction effect mm -hmm. there. Thank you. Obviously, I, obviously something that future research should definitely consider, uh, since we also know from the behavioral theory that cognitive and motivational aspects are not independent. So definitely something interesting. Um, um, Jennifer, I have a question for you, and this one's coming from Andre Piketty, who is uh, actually asking about diversity, like how do you define, <laughs> and this is a super clever question, how do you define diversity, like, you know, because we kind of assume that we do have starting point uh, in, in the same definition, but obviously having a, a multidisciplinary panel in here, we should have started with definition. And then Andre is also writing that that in, in, you know, in, in your study, um, in relation to your study, do you differentiate between the, uh, uh, the effects? Uh, do you predict differences in the effect? So what, 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 what are your ideas around that? Well, no, I think that's an excellent question. And there's no doubt that how we define diversity has a big impact on, you know, probably the overall findings of the study. And, and there can be, a, yeah, well, the way we define it in our study was looking at it's a subjectively experienced sense of commonality based on a belief in a common ancestry and shared culture. It's considered subjective because members and non-members identify the ethnic group that they perceive to be present in their society. So they have, you know, we have, you have information from observers and from people themselves telling, you know, talking about where, how they identify their ethnicity. And this is based on the the data that we used in our study, which was from the Ethnic Power uh, Relation Project, EPR, and the Minority at Risk Project, MAR data. And, uh, and certainly, you know, if somebody else is defining other people's ethnicity for them, that, you know, or that's what the purpose is kind of comparing the, the insiders outside or your self-evaluation and others. Um, and other studies have measured these differently and tried to get more of a, you know, a, just a racial breakdown and analyze it in that respect. So it's, it is very important to look at those issues because they're undoubtedly going to tease out different relationships. Uh, but I think we really like these, I think these uh, particular measures are very powerful because they capture both the self-report and how other people in society view uh, particular groups, which is also equally important in assessing whether they consider them insiders, outsiders. Um, but yes, I think, and then it also matters whether you're at, you know, what level of analysis are you at too? Are we looking at the country level, uh, the inside the internal firm level? So there's a lot of different dynamics here. Hmm. And, and speaking of different levels, um, it's actually something, Davina, you and um, your uh, co-authors talked uh, a lot in the paper. And in fact, Arthur Lee is also um, asking whether you can uh, specify or clarify, perhaps, a huge relationship between national and organizational cultures. In your paper, Davina, you kind of accepted some kind of a nested view, when you almost, you could say, um, explain what's uh, what's a superior over what, but but obviously also is uh, stressing the point about interrelationships, right? So how did you untangle this complex dynamics that we've observed usually observe between national and organizational culture, and what does it mean for future researchers who are trying to unfold further the role of multiculturalism in the multinational? Culture? 
Just... Yeah, and this also fits with, I don't know if it was the same question, but there was a question about um, sort of societal level multiculturalism versus individual level multiculturalism. So um, I would agree uh, with the notion that it's problematic that we have the same term at multiple levels. Um, I don't really see an easy way to get around that because we've talked about multicultural societies, we've talked about multicultural slash diverse organizations, and then multicultural individuals. Um, so just from a definitional standpoint, I think they are fairly well defined, but the issue is that when you're discussing them, it needs to be clear what the level of analysis is. And I think it can be challenging for people who are maybe more used to the term being used in one way than another to, to specify, this is what we mean by the individual level multiculturalism. We're not talking about society. We're talking about the person having multiple ones. But more specifically to the question you raised about sort of nestedness, I think that is kind of challenging because you do have things nested in one another, I guess, the 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 joy of our paper being theoretical is we didn't have to test these things um but ideally you would kind of look at these different levels to be able to measure the individual level multiculturalism then you could look at the organizational level in terms of how diverse is it and then you can try to tease out kind of what is it the organizational level what is it the individual level and then similarly at a broader level so it goes a bit into Jennifer's paper to some extent too right in terms of this is what's happening in the company and how do you how do you kind of define it and what the effects would be but I, I don't have a really easy, um, you know, quick way to say this is this is an ideal way to do this. I don't know if others might have a better uh, suggestion for how to tease these out. I was thinking um, all those are different levels, so cultural, societal level, and organizational level. But if we look at uh, individuals' cultural identities. I'm not sure those identities are nested, right? I identify with a culture, I also identify with an organization. So if I look at their identities, probably we can kind of partial out those nested issues. And that could be a way to look at how different types of identities uh, or uh, different not levels of the identity, but different types of identities that all work together and influence individuals' behaviors. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very, indeed, a very useful perspective. And in this case, we are placing the phenomenon at the intersections uh, between levels, something that hopefully uh, we could do more in IP in the future rather than, you know, looking at them separately and uh, trying to disentangle them in a very simple way. Uh, Jonathan To, who is also uh, on this webinar, is reminding us that there was recently a point counterpoint uh, in Journal of Management Studies on distance as diversity in international management. Indeed, a very interesting read and uh, um, offers an um, uh, interesting perspective on that. I would agree with Jonathan, a highly relevant paper in that regard. Um, uh, if, we, if we go uh, again uh, a little bit closer to, um, you know, a theme that goes across all three papers, uh, then actually would like to kind of uh, uh, all panelists to reflect on the question that uh, Stacy Fitzmonster is asking in, in the in the Q&A. And basically question, um, or questions rather, sounds the following. I would like to hear your take on whether and how multiculturalism at the individual level, and may I also add, and, and at all other levels, <laughs> might influence, quote unquote, the bigger picture issues, like, for example, achieving sustainable development goals, or may I add to that, uh, strengthening organizational resilience, uh, for instance, in dealing with crisis, or something that is kind of beyond the traditional and most obvious performance quote and quote performance outcomes, right? Admittedly, uh, Stacy writes, I sometimes struggle with linking these things across level and would really appreciate hearing your thoughts. Uh, let me, let me, uh, let me uh, start with you because I think it's extremely um, interesting question. So uh, um, let's see what we have. Uh, who would like to 
take a first try. Jennifer, shall we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the sustainable development goals fit, you know, are a perfect fit for certainly looking at the national level as we did in our study and, and that the sustainable development goals have really, you know, they've identified various factors that undermine stability, in, you know, stability in the country uh, that, you know, undermine justice. And basically, you know, if you have an unjust society, which is really what you have when you have a lot of exclusion of minority groups, you know, based and, you know, they don't have access to politics, don't have economic access, uh, then, then you have a lot of instability, it's unsustainable. And so therefore, I think the sustainable development goals are, you know, an excellent fit with the overall goals of making society more stable and taking advantage of the, diver of the diversity. I also think that, you know, one of, there's a implicit bias in a lot of the research, as I was saying, throughout economics, political science, and to some extent, uh, lesser extent IB, that violence, uh, if you have an ethnically diverse society and you have violence, that's because, uh, you know, that's the, the diversity that's caused the violence. Um, but again, it, it's not the, and so therefore it leads people to look at diversity in a negative light. And even when we see the, you know, we've seen the conflicts here in the United States over the last year, but it's really more a reflection of how, again, uh, resources are not divided fairly or there's not equal opportunity. And so focusing more on that end than on the, you know, violence is a symptom of, you know, the, the uh, factors in society that lead to it. Mm. And, and while kind of reflecting on what you've just said, Jennifer, I, I immediately uh, kind of thought about the uh, Jibs Decade Award winner paper um, by Stahl et al. from 2020, published in January 2021 in Jibs, uh, because the main, one of the main arguments, basically diversity per se, um, it's not necessarily resource, uh, and diversity per se, in fact, uh, and that's what we know from the team level literature, creates conflicts, miscommunications, difficulties, problem solving. It's how we manage diversity that, you know, and basically also getting towards the inclusion, literature on inclusion, that what matters. And somehow, you know, this is also what the, the kind of mechanisms that you identified, the societal, if you wish, at the macro level, right? It's not about ethnic diversity per se, it's, it's how we live this act within society. Super interesting. Echo, um, what are your reflections on the question that Stacey, in fact, your co-author asked, asked in so, the yeah. <laughs> So actually, I struggle with the same kind of question. So I see here there are two questions associated with Stacey's question. First is, whether those special skills or multicultural individuals can go beyond cultural domain. Because in our study, uh, the task outcomes we investigated are within the cultural domain, intercultural interactions, adaptability, or job performance in a multicultural environment. But if uh, we're looking at uh, sustainable development goals, that kind of goes beyond cultures, right? Multiple cultures, but this is more a global kind of approach. So you're not comparing different cultures, but how do you integrate them and benefit from that integration? So I struggle uh, about how multicultural individuals or even cultural intelligence goes beyond the cultural domain. And the second question I struggle with um, is whether it's always positive. Right, when you identify with multiple cultures, when even if we have higher level of cultural intelligence, does that always lead to positive outcome? Um, there might be negative outcomes as well. If you are multiple, if you are multicultural individuals and you accept internalized standards or requirements from different cultures, and then you might get into this cultural relative, you might take this cultural relative approach and might do something unethical in culture A, but it's okay in culture B. So I, I also struggle with whether it's always leading to a positive outcome instead of negative outcome. Um, so I do struggle with those two, uh, two different things, yeah. Hmm. So you're thinking that there may be some kind of crowding out effects uh, of certain aspects. Uh, Interesting thought. Um, definitely something that future research could look at. Davina, your reflections on what we've been discussing so far. 
Yeah, so I think that, so I agree with, with both uh, Echo and Jennifer's points. Um, and I was thinking when I saw Stacey's question that I mean, the sustainable development goals are so broad, right? So if you think of the UN's goals, they, they span so many different things. And it occurs to me um, that multiculturals, because they have so many different backgrounds and can see things from so many different perspectives, they might be able to think of um, sort of creative new ways to tackle these. Um, and so to the extent, and again, this could get at a level of analysis issue, but kind of to the extent that they have the ability to try to tackle these in whatever context it is, whether it's an organization or individually or whatever, um, they might be well suited to that. And in terms of um, sort of Echo's point about culture general versus culture specific, um, I think that whether it's and that, that is something I believe we need more research on. But if it's culture specific, they might be well suited to saying, well, in this context, this would be a great way to try to move that goal further. And if it's culture general, then they also have the ability to say across different contexts, what might be a good way to achieve it. So I think they could have an impact on it, but I do think that you know the power dynamics and, and the other organizational and other facets could come into play as to whether they were able to do this kind of thing. And as Echo said, you know, it's not as though multiculturals are gonna be perfect at everything. There are also negative aspects of that as well, which is a slightly different topic. Right, and you could say, in fact, uh, uh, David Petrupson also is asking another question that very much relates to what you, um, uh, just said, and specifically, he said, a multicultural in um, society, in my opinion, is not the same as multicultural individual. For example, you might be multicultural individual in a very homogeneous, non-inclusive society. So he's uh, basically in his questioning is calling for concept clarity um, as well as construct clarity. And I think it, the, the bringing the clarity to this issue is the first. Step, identifying the level issues is the second step and looking at the, you could say, um, if you wish, interplay and interaction between multicultural individual with, for example, immediate context, be that firm attributes or societal characteristics or in-group or <laughs> you name it, right, networks. I think that that probably would be uh, this, the third step. Uh, uh, going forward. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Matt uh, Raskovich, he's asking a question, um, or rather perhaps the you know, reflection point in here. Do we need to take a more nuanced understanding of diversity in terms of breadth, depth, and various degree of silence of social categories, which are used for group categorization? Yeah. So do you think we need the, yeah, go ahead, please. Sure, great question. And I think it, it ties in a bit with, uh, Another question I see here, I think it's from possibly from Andre, what is the difference between high, low, and moderate levels of diversity? So I think they're very related. I think, uh, you know, when we look at what we mean by moderate is that you only have a few groups. So you have, uh, and what happens at moderate levels of diversity is then a few groups, if they're dominant and in, you know, the economic and political sphere, they have the power to exclude others because they can, uh, you know, there's enough numbers in that group that makes them, uh, you know, more problematic. Whereas if you have a very homogenous society or a extremely diverse society, then the differences are less relevant and there's less ability for one group to exclude others. Not impossible, but certainly uh, less likely. So that kind of gets partly into this group, in-group, out-group, and how we define those different levels. Um, did I answer that full question for Matt too? Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I so. <laughs> okay, <right. laughs> could I ask Matt about it? But Matt could actually uh, write a comment in the chat right, exactly. if, uh, if he would like to right. ask you a follow-up question. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, there is a little bit like moving towards, again, this is something that I'd like to ask, uh, um, you know, all three of you reflect. Uh, Carl Moore is saying that I'm doing research on introverts and um, um, extroverts as leaders, I presume in global leaders or leaders of multicultural, I presume, in the executive suite. I have noted a culture overlay, any sorts, in a sense. Um, for people who are doing research on such related topics, like, for example, global leadership, um, 
uh, how could they benefit from from the insight that you generated in your three papers? You know how uh, in, in 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 what direction can you make their life easier? <laughs> Davina, let's start with you. I don't know if we make their life much easier, um, but in terms of the broader question, okay, of, so what do you make their research more interesting? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think there is definitely the argument to be made that multicultural individuals are likely to be good global leaders um, because they understand all these different contexts um, and this type of thing. In terms of the specific question about introverts and extroverts and the cultural overlay, I don't really have an answer to that, and I haven't really um, explored that kind of topic, um, but I would imagine to the extent that perhaps certain cultures might have certain personality traits, if you're multicultural, it would depend a little bit on are you engaging in cultural frame switching, um, you know, or are you adopting all of these and that sort of thing, but I would, I would guess um, that people who have multicultural competencies and capabilities are going to be very good um, as global leaders if we're defining global leadership as it typically is done in terms of exerting influence across boundary conditions and across cultural and national bounds and this type of thing. I don't know if that really answers the, the question. Okay, Jennifer, what's your take on that? I mute on there. Um, hey, let's see. And it's, I think, um, yeah, it's because that's a, a little bit outside the bounds of, you know, what we're, we're studying in this particular paper. But I think that, uh, you know, what we need to do is develop more strategies for kind of bridging these different cultures. I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges. And we obviously see that now, you know, playing out in organizations all over the U.S. with how do you make, how do you do, create a more inclusive uh, workplace, or and then we're also working at the policy level in the in the country, and so I think it's going to we're uh, uh, you know every country has its own dynamic and own uh, own characteristics, and so we're going to each country is going to have to assess how do you increase where are the gaps in inclusion, who is excluded, and how do we try to remedy those situations. So I, I it's a it's a big job, but I think we're we're moving forward in a way that we maybe haven't before. We certainly have an opportunity to do so. Excellent. Echo, your take? Yeah, I can also uh, see some avenues that we can take to understand how multicultural leaders contribute to their organizations. As Davina said, they have multiple perspectives, so maybe they can understand people's point of view, they can have a creative solutions, and they can be more flexible, right? Maybe when they face people with different cultural backgrounds, they have different leadership styles that fit the followers' expectations better, and they can better relate to their um, employees with different cultural backgrounds emotionally, understanding their, their struggles. So there's also emotional kind of support and empathetic concerns uh, of their employees. And speaking of this topic, I know Lee Martin, she's doing an excellent paper on multiculturalism and leadership. I saw she's in the audience. Maybe she can share some of her insights in the chat box as well. Okay, wonderful. I also noticed that Hayo Hong also in the audience and her research actually showed that multicultural employees preferred and actually perform better uh, under the leadership of multicultural leaders. Um, so that's, uh, that's definitely something that we could take in here. Uh, a little bit of a pro provocative question uh, from Madeline uh, Bausch, uh, who basically uh, addressed it also to all of you. If you define multiculturalism, multiculturalism referring to multiple cultures, isn't it then everybody a multicultural individual? Where do you draw the line for studying the impact of, um, of multiculturalism on, 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 on organization? And that's actually an interesting um, uh, issue because um, uh, in, in some of the research that uh, we are doing, you know, um, we also found uh, lots of monoculturals that uh, uh, identify themselves as multiculturals. Um, so how do you how do you work with that, Davina? Yeah, so we we talk about this a bit in our paper. Um, so some of this get and again, you know, you might disagree with our perspective, but we were thinking that 
it's important to have all three, knowledge, identification, and internalization. Part of the reason for that is to kind of avoid the, oh, I feel like I'm multicultural because my great, 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 great grandfather was Irish and I really, I like Irish beer. Um, you know, so, so this way you can get a little bit more than just identification because um, you have all three aspects. We also talk about how it should be beyond a baseline. So there's a certain base level of knowledge maybe people would have, or, or you know, I uh, might identify with the group, this kind of thing. So we believe you kind of can go beyond everybody's multicultural, but some of this depends on how you are uh, thinking about it. Because as we said, it's not just national culture, it can be other cultures as well. But, but key would be having all three different dimensions in our view, not just one, and going beyond the baseline of what the general population in society would have um, with regard to those three. Um, but it is definitely an excellent question and it is uh, difficult because that also goes to if you're going to have a cutoff point, how do you do that? And that's part of the reason we want it as a continuum in terms of more or less um, for each of those. Okay, Iko, in your setting. So actually, I you... will, so yeah, actually uh, I think I agree with Davina's last point when you look at this as a more continuous variable, right? We tend not to draw a categorical differences between modern cultures and multicultures, but we look at a more continuum from modern culture to slightly multicultural to moderately multicultural and highly multicultural. And then we can include a large uh, population in our study. And probably a lot of monocultures, they have higher level of knowledge but they have very low level identification and then they will overall will be a slight or moderately uh, multicultural. So if I look at the continual variable, it might solve the, the, this problem. Interesting. Jennifer, um, what, how, do you, how would you answer that question? <laughs> well, since we didn't, we didn't look at individuals at the individual level, but so considering the national level, uh, you know, what we're, we are looking at is really power differences. So you could have one ethnic group in a country that might be high status, but in another country that same, uh, you know, individual or group would be lower status. So it's more about how, whether or not that particular group in a particular country, whatever the country is that you're looking at, is that group high status, low status, included, excluded, and that has a direct bearing on, uh, you know, the, I guess the difficulty in managing risk or leveraging all the, uh, le uh, leveraging the benefits of diversity, things like that. So I, I think that's the core of it, really gets at the power dynamics and what Davina was talking about earlier. Mm. And actually Matt also notes, notes that Davina, that you, when you're referring to the power di dynamics, and discussing high-low uh, in-group versus out-group status dynamics among MNC in, uh, employees. So there is a there is a little bit of a um, kind of um, there is not it's not that simple. <laughs> so there is a there is a lots of uh, different combinations. Um, would you like to comment on that? I can see you nodding. Oh, sure. I mean, I don't think I have that much to add. Those were just kind of examples of how we thought they might play a role if there are differences. Obviously, if, you know, both are high and the organization is embracing all of them, that could be a little different. Um, so I think the dynamics could vary based on what's going on in the organization, based on who has power, based on whether they're open to, to everything. But, but yes, obviously, if one were to do an empirical study, it'd be important um, to explore all these different possibilities. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, let me just, before we get to the uh, further towards more uh, kind of um, empirical studies and appreciation, just one more question around the theory and disciplinary approaches. And, and that was actually somehow was brought by Irene uh, Skogart Smith. Uh, and I know that I I Irene is from a different um, say disciplinary uh, background compared to say <laughs> us. And um, she's asking a question, um, how do we avoid essentializing culture when talking about multiculturalism? So in order to be able to account for dynamic process of mixing, hybridizing and so on. So, you know, when I, when I read that question, even before I saw that there was actually, I said, okay, that the person from the very different disciplinary background, right? And I, I said at the beginning of the panel that we have a, you know, 
uh, nice variation here in terms of where we come from, in terms of disciplines. But nevertheless, uh, here's a very basic question about something that we very seldom talk about. Anybody would like to give it a try? I missed the very first word you said that she had used to describe it that in the question. I was looking through the questions. It's a... Oh, sorry. It says, how do we avoid essentializing culture as a thing we have one or more of when talking about multiculturalism at the individual level? Oh, at the individual level, yes. That's hard. Right. And in, in order to be able to account for dynamic processes of mixing, hybridizing, and so on, even on the societal level, right? In fact, Mika Sonegard later on in the, in, the, in, in the list also is talking about melting pot arguments, you know, and all this. How could you talk about the, uh, you know, culture as a thing in multiculturals if it's all mixing and hybridizing and moving, moving forward? So it's a little bit more, again, uh, some of the basic definitional questions that I think sometimes we take for granted. Yeah, I think some of this we we tried to allude to a little bit um, in the definition by trying to get at hybrid and emergent cultures because um, and Lee Martin has talked about this in her work um, quite a bit, right? That that you aren't necessarily you know this national culture, that national culture, and and there is mixing that occurs. So that's part of the reason we went to the more than one and. Obviously, we know that you know cultures can change over time, um, and it also can be contextually dependent, um, which goes back into the cultural frame switching literature. So I, I do think it's a very important question, and it is important to to recognize that we do have hybrid and emergent types of cultures. It's not just you know two, three, four. It's not it's not necessarily going to be multiple numbers, but it does make it a little bit more more challenging to try to um, measure this type of thing. Right. I, I would, Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, I would agree with that. And also that's, I think it's not so much, uh, you know, that, yeah, where, where there's a specific endpoint in that respect, but it's that the diversity has been shown in many studies to be, as we talked about before, you know, really to create better teams, better workplaces, better outcomes, more innovation. Uh, but so it's not so much the content of that diversity, but and it comes in many different forms. Uh, so again, I don't think that, but that maybe, maybe what the part of the question is just being conscious that it's not that we're striving for one end goal or one uh, particular mix. It's just appreciate, you know, making sure that every uh, group or, or however they identify is included in some way so that they are not part of the, you know, uh, those who are disadvantaged politically or economically, at least in our case of our study. So it's, yeah, I don't think there's like a, yeah a goal here in that respect. Okay. When I meant in terms of, you know, the type of diversity you want to achieve, it's just respecting all the different kinds of diversity and not saying, you know, if that was part of the question is saying, do you want a, you know, this type of society and this is what you value? No, you know, that's not where I, I think we're going mm -hmm. at all. Okay. And then let's uh, move a little bit towards, uh, so what, question so a little bit talking about the uh, implications and uh, let uh, let me kind of put a uh, say practitioner hat on and say okay well I, I read your wonderful papers and I listened to your wonderful presentation so what is it what is it exactly you are telling me are you telling me that as a uh, manager in uh, &E, I would I would be better off of hiring as many multiculturals as possible. Is that what you're saying to me? So I, I would personally say no, um, because I think a lot depends on what the purpose is, right? Um, and so, I mean, it goes back to the, the general diversity research, which I'm sure Jennifer can speak much more to. But, you know, if you're dealing with a complex task where you need a lot of creativity and maybe you want to merge different perspectives, you're working in a multinational context or this kind of thing, then it would probably make a lot of sense. If you're looking for someone to do accounting, for example, um, and you just need to follow national norms, just make sure you have someone who knows those national norms. So I think um, in terms of hiring practices, it would depend on what 
they would like to accomplish um, with the person they're hiring. And multiculturals do have a lot of skills. And in many contexts that can be very beneficial and it is good to have diverse perspectives. Um, but to say, you know, oh, we hire a multicultural, that person's gonna be the best for everything. Not necessarily because it also would relate to organizational context. So is the context of the organization such that they will embrace multiculturals and different perspectives? Or is it just, you know, we're handpicking people because we want them to fulfill a certain quota, um, but we're not going to make them feel welcome or um, have them able to use their skills, then that's not really going to make a difference. So I think the organizational context would play a big role with regard to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So we'll go what, for what purpose. Echo, what's your take from it? Yeah, adding to uh, Davina's point as well, I think um, in some situations, having too many multicultural individuals might actually slow down the decision process, right? Because they have too many different perspectives they want to discuss. But in some situations, they may just need a quick decision or this question doesn't relate to those different cultural perspectives. So in some situations, when you have too many multiculturals, uh, it might not be the best uh, for, for this task. And also, as Davina said, it's not just about hiring as many multiculturals as possible, it's how you um, utilize their skills, how do you make them feel they're proud of their, their identity so they're more likely to draw on those special skills to contribute to the organizations. But if you hire a lot of them, but create an environment somehow um, discourage them to draw on their cultural identity and their knowledge and skills, and then it's probably a, a negative uh, consequence for, for the company. Last night, while I was teaching this uh, topic with my master's students, some of them, they are multicultural individuals in the organization. Some of them do experience, uh, do express that um, they want to have more multicultural colleagues so they can feel they're not those minorities in the organization, but they can feel part of a bigger community. Um, so when you companies hire more multicultural, it's also important to create um, this community and to um, create this um, collaboration interaction, not just among multicultural, probably also between multicultural and monocultural. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, a um, uh, very brief answer from you on this question. Sure. Well, we didn't look specifically at multiculturals, but to, since our paper was in the Journal of International Business Policy, kind of the practical implications we looked at is really, uh, you know, I think there's a overemphasis on or the tendency to look at diversity as a risk. And that was really where the kind of the heart of our study and the purpose of our study in the beginning was to investigate, you know, is diversity really a, a risk in the way that others have conceptualized it? And although we're, you know, we are limited by the bounds of our study in terms of what we can extrapolate from that, but I think the takeaway is that it's in business interest to influence government policy in order to in promote inclusion and to value diversity instead of seeing it as a cost or a limitation. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I'm very comfortable leaving that webinar on that point. Um, multiculturalism is extremely interesting concept uh, and there are so many uh, approaches and sides of that. Uh, one thing we can see for now uh, that multiculturalist, multiculturals per se so to say, is not a strategic resource, you would say, right? These are just individuals with multiple co cognitive and motivational, etc. dimensions. However, it's how we manage them, right? These are within the organizational context or within the context of multinational enterprises, country or society. That's where the potential differentiated advantage is. So it may be so that, you know, there will be um, um, a greater perspective in the future research arguing that competitive advantage of multinational enterprises may as well come from their ability to manage uh, their multicultural workforce. So I would like to thank you very much for, um, uh, for your insights and thank you to all of the participants for interesting questions. Um, we, we we, let's let's keep the conversation going. Um, uh, I also would like to thank everyone involved in the uh, um, we could say preparation and development uh, of this series of webinars, which is of, uh, which is um, which which are offered in collaboration between two journals and the um, 
AIB. Uh, again, a big uh, thank you to our technology support as well as webinar coordinators. I would like to use this opportunity to um, advertise the next webinar, which is going to be on the June 15th uh, on the topic of uh, how do multinational enterprises engage with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, a collection of very interesting paper, um, a lineup of very, in very interesting speakers. So I very much hope that you um, join us. I also very much hope that you um, Join and register for the um, upcoming um, annual uh, conference, annual meeting of Academy of International Business um, and uh, looking forward to the uh, conversations there. Thank you very much and goodbye.